Welcome to church. It's uh, great to see you all here again um, uh, to worship God together and we uh, pray that uh, we'll all have a blessed service, uh, particularly as we celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, this Sunday. Uh, just a reminder that uh, for our evening service, our Grow service this evening at five o'clock, uh, it's the last in our series on the fear of the Lord. It's a, been a great series. Um, if, even if you missed a bit of it, it's still great to come. This last one is fantastic, so come along to that uh, this evening at five o'clock if you can. And we welcome Pastor Andrew to the pulpit to lead us in worship this morning. Thank you. Well, good morning, congregation. It's lovely to see you all, and it's lovely to uh, be together to worship the, the Lord our God uh, this Lord's Day. Our call to worship uh, comes from the psalmist. In Psalm 66, we hear these words. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. We've come to bow down before the Lord our God uh, and to worship him. So let's come to him in a time of silent and individual prayer as we bring uh, our own prayers to the Lord for this time of worship. So I invite you to pray silently and individually. Lord our God, we do thank you that uh, all around the earth today uh, your people will be bowing down before you and we thank you that we can uh, join uh, that chorus of praise and uh, adoration and glory to your name as, as your people are here in, in this place. Uh, Lord, uh, your deeds are awesome. Uh, when we look at the, the world uh, you have made, uh, we see your, your great power, your great, great creativity, uh, when, we, when we think about the way that you sustain uh, all things moment by moment, day by day, uh, we catch a glimpse of how awesome you are. Lord, in particular, as we think about uh, your work of redemption, your, your saving uh, people through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we see uh, how awesome uh, you are. And Lord, we pray that as we worship, you would uh, open our eyes yet again to, to see your glory, that you would open our lips to praise you, and that we might find um, joy in you, whatever our circumstance might be this morning, that we might be able to rejoice because you are our God and because of the things that you have done. So be with us, we pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name as we say together, Amen. Could you please stand? As we come into God's presence, he warmly greets his people, saying, grace and peace be yours in abundance uh, through the knowledge of God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing uh, to the Lord our God using the words of Book of Worship 160, uh, Father, we love you. So let's uh, lift our voices and sing together.
seated. And will you join with me now as we come to God in prayer? Uh, Let's pray together. Lord our God, we've just sung of our love for you, and we do love you, but we recognise too that sometimes our talk is cheap. We sing of our love and then we review our week and we can recognise all the, the times that we've loved other things above you. We think of all the times our love toward you has been cold. We think of all the times we haven't acted on our confession that we love you. And so we we come again this morning to seek your mercy, to seek the mercy of your forgiveness, forgiveness that we know that we, we don't merit, we don't deserve and we can't earn. Forgiveness that you're willing to grant us because Jesus died for sinners. Forgiveness that you can offer, O Lord our God, because of the power of the cross. The power of Christ's sacrifice on the cross to pay the debt of our sin, every last penny. To exhaust the judgment we deserve for sin, so there's no judgment left for us. To remove from us the curse of sin, so that we might live under your eternal blessing. The power of the cross to overcome Satan's power to accuse us before your throne. And so we we thank you, our Lord and our God, for the powerful cross work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is our great high priest in heaven, where he ever lives, to intercede for his people. And so we uh, come to you and we bring our prayers in his wonderful saving name as we say together in jesus name amen i'm going to hear god's assurance of pardon to his people uh, with some words from uh, the book of corinthians uh, where we read jews demand signs and greeks look for wisdom but we preach christ crucified a stumbling block to jews and foolishness to gentiles but to those whom god has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Uh, Christ's cross is power and it is God's wisdom. And we're going to sing of that now uh, using the words of power of the cross. So let's uh, stand and sing together the words of this hymn.
through the power of the cross, we, of course, have forgiveness. Uh, but through the power of the cross, uh, also, uh, we have the ability to, to live new lives, uh, new lives of obedience and faithfulness to the Lord our God. And we're going to read about what that looks like now from the Gospel of Luke. So will you turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 3. Uh, later on in the sermon, we'll be continuing our, our series uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and we're, we'll be considering the ministry of John the Baptist. And so now we're reading Luke's uh, account of the, of the same story. So this will give us a bit of a, bit of a taster uh, for what we're, we're heading into. Uh, but, but in Luke's account, there's some details uh, here uh, that are not found in, in Matthew. Uh, John the Baptist is, is preaching uh, a baptism uh, of repentance for the forgiveness of his sins. And in Luke, he actually uh, fleshes out uh, what, what true repentance looks like. So he gives us the, the details, uh, if you like. So we're going to read uh, from uh, Luke uh, 3, 7 to 14, and our brother Eddie will lead us in the reading. Thanks, Eddie. So reading from Luke chapter 3, verses 7 to 14. John said to the crowds, coming out to be baptised by him. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then the soldiers asked him, and what shall we do? And he replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to come to the Lord our God now in prayer and we're going to pray that we might be a, a people who produce uh, fruit in keeping uh, with repentance. Uh, we'll also be remembering uh, Ed. Uh, he has surgery uh, coming Saturday. So we'll pray for the Lord's uh, blessing uh, upon that. So let's, uh, let's pray, congregation. Lord our God, we thank you for your word uh, and we recognise that you call us not just to talk the talk of the Christian faith but to walk the walk, uh, to, to live in, in the ways that you've called us to live as your redeemed people. And so we, we pray that we might be a people who produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Lord, we, we recognise that even here we, we need your help. We lack strength, but you are the mighty God. We recognise that apart from our Lord Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. He is our life, our strength, he is the, the oxygen of our Christian existence. And so we, we come and we pray that you would enable us to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Help us, Lord our God, to turn from selfishness and to produce the fruits of selflessness, to be willing to make sacrifices, to give of our time, to give of our gifts, to use our finances to bless others, whether that's in our, our families, our, our workplaces, our, our neighbourhoods, help us to be selfless. We pray that you would supply for us as a, as a church our need for an elder as well. Make hearts willing and keen to serve you in this way. Lord, we pray that you would help us to turn from speech which tears others down and speak words which build others up. Give us grace even this day to speak uh, truth into each other's lives, to refrain from unwholesome speech, that we might have words that can bring blessing and encouragement uh, to those around us. Help us, we pray, to turn from our self-dependence and to be completely dependent upon you. Lord, we, 
can be so foolish and we think we can get through life on our own. Uh, Lord, grant that we might be more prayerful, that uh, in all things you might be our first port of call as we, as we pour out our joys and our struggles to you. Help us to be humble and to recognise that any success that we have is not because we are so smart and clever, but because you have granted it to us. Lord, help us to turn from being stingy to being generous, uh, that we recognise that all we have is, is a gift from you and that we are just stewards of what you've given us. Uh, help us to be generous with what we have personally. Lord, we thank you for providing for us as a, as a church in the year gone by. And we pray that you would please provide for our physical needs in the year ahead and that you would uh, bless the work of the, the Board of Management also as they administer uh, the funds and look after the facilities. Lord, enable us to provide the, the deacons as well with generous contributions so that uh, they can show uh, uh, works of mercy to others. Lord, help us to turn from uh, mistrust and to turn and, and always uh, have trust in you. Help us to trust in you in, in all circumstances, not just when life is, is easy and good, but also when life is hard and painful and full of sorrow. Lord, we, we do pray for those whose circumstances are difficult at the moment, for those who are sick, for those who are grieving, for those who are struggling. Lord, we pray for, for Ed and Pauline as they, as they look ahead to, to surgery uh, in, on the weekend. And, and, and Lord, it's been a long pathway for them. And so we pray that in your grace you would sustain them and be near to them and grant them all that they need. Lord, we uh, think too of those who have lost loved ones. We think of uh, Pete Engelbrecht and, and that he's uh, lost his father recently as well and we pray for your comfort. We thank you for the hope of the, the life to come and that uh, Lord, it is better by far to be with Christ. Lord, we pray that you would give all of us a greater trust in you. Lord, we, we thank you for your word and we, we, we pray that as we come to your word in a, in a few moments, uh, that you would so water our hearts with the truth and with your grace that, that our lives would be full of good fruit to the glory of your name. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. We are going to continue our worship by bringing our gifts and offerings now. Uh, there's two collections this morning. The first is for the work of the church and the second is for the work of uh, Compassion uh, through whom we sponsor children. Uh, so it's for needy children. So two collections and while we bring our gifts, uh, we're also going to sing uh, the words of Speak, O Lord, uh, as we prepare our hearts to, to hear God speak to us through His Word and through the uh, preaching of the Word. So let's uh, bring our gifts and let's lift our voices.
Let's now turn together to the Gospel of Matthew. So will you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter 3. And we'll read this morning uh, from verse 1 through to verse uh, 12. Matthew 3, from verse 1. Before we read, let's uh, come to God in prayer again. Will you pray with me? Lord, we do pray that you would uh, build your church, that Christ would build his church now through the reading and the preaching of the word, that you would give us faith to to believe uh, all that you have said, give us the faith that acts on what has been spoken, And give us faith, we pray, that sees the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, the only Saviour and Redeemer of sinners. We pray these things in his name as we say together. Amen. Matthew 3 from verse 1. Let's hear God's word together. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food were locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor, gathering the wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So far, the reading of God's word. Congregation, some people have very unique ministries. I think of a man called uh, Henry Gerrick. Uh, He was a a Lutheran uh, pastor uh, for the Allies in in World War uh, II. And he was assigned to be the chaplain at Nuremberg Prison. He was the Protestant uh, chaplain uh, to war criminals awaiting trial and he ministered to some uh, of the men who committed the worst atrocities this world has seen. He had a very unique ministry. I think of uh, Joni uh, Erickson uh, Tata. Uh, At 17 years old she had a a diving accident, she she became a quadriplegic, Uh, she suffers uh, constantly with, with great Uh, pain, Uh, she needs 24-hour care, uh, but she has a worldwide ministry, uh, ministering to to, to young and and old and telling them of the the hope that she has in Jesus Christ. She she remarkably says her wheelchair is is not a tragedy, it's a tool, it's a tool that God has given her to speak to others about the hope that she has. She has a very unique ministry. Uh, And there's someone else who has a unique ministry, and that is uh, John, who we call John the Baptist. He had a unique ministry that was given to him directly uh, by God, a ministry that that only he had. He had the prophetic ministry of preparing the way for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So so he was the the precursor of of the ministry that that Jesus was going to come and perform. Now, 
We're not to think of John as the, the warm-up act until the, the real thing arrives. Uh, he was making vital preparations for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and whilst his ministry is unique, it's unique once for all time, the message he had is actually not unique. It's a, it's a message also for all time because he brought a message of repentance. Now, I'll, I'll just give a quick definition now of repentance because we're going to talk about it again later. Uh, repentance is, is a turning away from sin. It's a turning back to God, back to His grace, and back to His paths of righteousness. Uh, repentance, uh, we might know, is one of those words that gets a, a bad rap. It's a word that uh, many in our so-called modern and progressive age might turn their nose up at. It, it goes in, along in that package of words uh, that includes things like sin, uh, judgment, uh, wrath. But it's an important biblical word because John tells us here that without repentance, there's only the prospect of judgment. So this is one of those uncomfortable words uh, that's going to be part of one of those uncomfortable sermons because God's not so much concerned with your comfort uh, and, and concerned that you, you feel nice and good all the time. God is more concerned with your eternal welfare and your, your everlasting joy and he's, he's not afraid to, to make you uncomfortable to see those things. There can be no eternal welfare or everlasting joy without repentance and so we're going to look at the unique ministry of John the Baptist this morning. Uh, before we get there, just note uh, the context uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. We, we skip from uh, Jesus' uh, birth and the events around his birth and his, his moving home, and we skip uh, right up to his ministry as an adult. We don't get much about Jesus' childhood. I mean, the only thing we know about his childhood is, is Jesus' visit to the temple when he was uh, 12 years old and he was giving the, the scholars there a bit of a theology lesson. It doesn't seem that important for us to know about Jesus' childhood, but we need to know about his ministry. And, and John is preparing for the ministry of Jesus. So let's consider his unique ministry. First, let's look at the man with a unique ministry. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, John uh, appears out of nowhere. No introduction. Uh, there's no mention that he's actually Jesus' relative. There's no story about John's birth. There's seemingly no connection to anything that has, has gone before. He just appears. And that's because we're meant to see that he's like... He, he's standing in the line of those great Old Testament prophets who just appear on the scene. Uh, back in the book of uh, Kings, uh, there's, a, there's a story uh, about a famous prophet, Elijah, who just appears out of nowhere before the king and he calls the king to repent. And John the Baptist, Matthew's painting him uh, here, this is Elijah version 2.0. Now, you've got to understand that the appearance of a prophet uh, for Israel would have been very welcome news because uh, there'd been prophetic silence for about 400 years. Uh, the, the last prophet was, was Malachi and he brought uh, God's word centuries beforehand. And the people of God were waiting for a new prophet to arise. Uh, you think waiting for your birthday is hard, kids? Waiting a whole year? Well, there are people who waited their whole lifetime to get a prophetic word from God. And they got nothing. So this is big news. A new prophet has come. In fact, this is the prophet that the other prophets, the Old Testament prophets, actually spoke about. Uh, Malachi, we read, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah, before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And the, the one Malachi spoke of, the Elijah, that's John. And so God's word has come. This, this is good news for God's people. And then this reminds us yet again that the most valuable and needful thing for us is to hear the living word of God. How, how blessed we are. Uh, not to have a, so much a, a, a fresh uh, word from God, but to have this timeless word in the Scriptures, which is always fresh. And, and this is where the real action is, congregation. I hope you understand that. The most important thing uh, that, that happened uh, this week is, is not something you heard about in the news. 
The most important thing that happened this week was that you read the Bible and you heard from the living God, that you, that you joined in worship and you heard the timeless truths that can change and transform the world. Without this, all is darkness. God has spoken his great and final word in Jesus Christ. And it's all in this book for us to treasure and delight ourselves in. What a blessed people we are. Back to the text. Look at John's appearance. He's wearing camel's hair and a leather belt. Uh, not exactly your most uh, stylish uh, fashion of the day. Uh, does John lack dress sense like most of us contemporary males? Well, not at all. Uh, this is dress that is not simply fitting for the rigors of the wilderness where he lived. Uh, this dress is meant to call to mind what the Old Testament prophets wore. And there's one Old Testament prophet in particular who wore exactly the same thing. And no, no points for guessing who that is. That's Elijah. So John not only speaks like a prophet, he looks like a prophet. That's the point. And why is John living in the wilderness as he conducts his ministry? Well, we see uh, he's conducting his ministry there in fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, we've, we've seen time and time again in the Gospel of Matthew that Matthew is showing us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, he's not uh, something new and, and it's not kind of God's plan as, as things get into the first century. God comes up with this new great funky plan for Jesus. This is the plan all along. Since the foundation of the world, God's plan was always to send the Messiah to save his people from their sins. And part of that plan was there'd be one uh, who would come uh, in the wilderness and who would be a voice calling people to repentance. Uh, the wilderness is actually a very fitting place for John's ministry to take place because in the Old Testament prophets, again, the wilderness is synonymous as a place of refreshment, renewal. It's synonymous as a place of new beginnings for God's people. And, and, and so here is the one coming, saying there's a new beginning that's going to be found in Jesus Christ. That leads us quite naturally as we think about uh, the voice to the message of his, this unique ministry, the message of this unique ministry. I don't know about you, but when, when uh, I think about John uh, from this passage here, there's, there's one word associated with John. It's John the Baptist. John the Baptist. He's the original Baptist, we think. And we'll talk about baptism in, in a minute, but note the emphasis here is not on baptism. It's on his preaching. Uh, he's the voice, as the prophet Isaiah said. He's not the baptizer, he's the voice. And verse 1 actually gives us the, the focus of his ministry. Uh, have a look at verse 1. He's John, the preacher. He comes preaching. Uh, and he's a preacher with a very clear message in verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So, there's a declaration, the kingdom of heaven is near. But there's also this call for response. You need, you need to repent. So, we'll look at these two aspects of John's preaching ministry. Firstly, the declaration that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. A kingdom of heaven, you might know, is actually a very important term uh, in Matthew. Uh, it appears 32 times. This is the first occurrence uh, in the gospel. Now, what is this kingdom? Where is the border of this kingdom? What is the flag? What's the national anth anthem of this kingdom? Which countries are incorporated into it? That, that's usually how we think about kingdom. We think about kingdom as a certain uh, realm, a certain geographical uh, location. But the idea of kingdom here is not a realm, but rule. It's the rulership of God. It's the, the reign of God. That's what we mean by kingdom of heaven, the reign of God and his son, Jesus Christ. And, and, and what John's saying is that this reign has arrived, that the rulership of God is, is just at the door because the king has come, Jesus. You know, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, they spoke of, of one who was to come, who would be given all authority on heaven and earth, and who would bring in an everlasting kingdom and all the peoples would come to serve him. And what John is saying, that kingdom is near because the king is here, Jesus Christ. And, and what we're going to find in the Gospel of Matthew is this beautiful truth 
that this kingdom of heaven is unlike, completely unlike the kingdoms of this earth. It's a kingdom where it's not the, the great and the mighty who are qualified for entry, the one who've done great things, but it's the lowly and the humble and, and those who know they are not worthy of the kingdom. They're welcome to come in. It's, it's the kingdom where, where greatness is not going to be found in, in, in giving all the orders and commands, but greatness is going to be found in humbly stooping to serve and do the lowest job. It's a kingdom where enemies are not to be wiped out, but they're to be forgiven. It's a kingdom with an immensely unusual king, one who possesses all glory and authority and who has all might and power, but who's willing to stoop to the humblest, lowliest place and who is even willing to die for his subjects. We're going to see in the Gospel of Matthew, this is a kingdom you've never seen before. It's a thrilling kingdom, a beautiful kingdom. And the point is, uh, that John's making, is that this kingdom is so near, you've got to be ready for it. It's one more sleep and it's here. It's one more minute and it's arrived. So what should you do to be ready? You've got to be ready. The kingdom's near. What do you do? Well, it's very clear, John tells us, you repent. This is the first thing that is needful uh, for the arrival of the kingship of God. This was the preparation back 2,000 years ago, repentance. It's, it's still actually the preparation now for the kingdom. Uh, do you know that Jesus actually preached the same message as John? Uh, when John the Baptist is put in prison, uh, Jesus himself then begins his preaching ministry. And I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, just over a a page to chapter 4, verse 17. And there we read, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. John's message was Jesus' message. I wonder what the message of the disciples was. Well, Jesus sent the disciples out to preach. Turn over a few more pages to uh, chapter uh, 10, uh, verse uh, 7. Chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus sends his disciples out. As you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, the explicit call to repentance is not found in that verse, but it's implicit given that's the message so far. The pattern is, the kingdom of heaven is near, therefore you need to repent. But what is repentance? Well, uh, repentance means to, to turn. It means you're, you're going the wrong way, and you've got to do a complete 180 and you've got to come back the other way. You're going your own way. You're doing your own thing. You're living under your own rule. You're sinning. And what do you need to do? You need to turn. You need to turn uh, back toward God, back toward faith in Him, back towards obedience towards Him. So, let's just be clear about this. Repentance is not simply being sad that you've done bad stuff. Repentance is not doing good stuff to make up for all the bad stuff that you've done. Repentance is not self-condemnation and saying, oh, I'm just so pathetic, I'm, I'm, I just can't do anything right. Repentance is a radical transformation of life, affecting the mind, the heart and the emotions, and of course, one's actions. It's what one child said, that, not just being sorry for doing what is wrong, it's being sorry enough to quit. Or as John might put it, it's to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Uh, that's John's emphasis when he speaks to the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's got some pretty strong words for them, doesn't he? A brood of vipers, that's not a compliment, is it? That's an insult. Uh, the reason for this is that these guys don't appear to believe in this whole repentance business. Repentance, that's for other people, that's not for us. And what, what possible, when you hear this, what, what do I have to repent from? I mean, I'm not that bad. What possible need, uh, it, it would seem, uh, that, that they had for repentance because they could, be, they could claim to be sons of Abraham. So they were, they were in the line that, that came from Abraham. And, and so they think that their, their righteous pedigree, you know, they come from the right family. The right, you know, the right genes, I've got the right genes, and, and therefore I'll be right with God, it's fine. But, but we understand, don't we, ha having an upstanding spiritual background never saved anybody. So what if your grandmother believed? 
So what your dad's an elder in the church? So what if you're brought up, you got brought up going to church and you even went to a Christian school? Don't get some kind of false assurance from these things. You need to believe and to repent. doesn't matter what your background is. You've got to believe that Jesus is the King who came to die for your sin. And you've got to repent. You've got to turn from your sin to faith in Him and obedience towards Him. And, and repentance, we find from the Scriptures, is always visible. It's not like the secret thing you're, you're kind of doing uh, that, that, that's just observed in privacy. It, it comes to expression in your life. You'll produce fruits in keeping with repentance. That's what John is calling for. Uh, we probably understand there's a, there is a false gospel uh, in churches today. It says rightly that Jesus died for your sins. And, and if you're a sinner, no matter what kind of sinner you are, you can come and you can find forgiveness through his death on the cross. And he accepts you as you are. And that gospel calls people to faith. But then, it misses out the whole repentance thing. It tells people that it's okay if the gospel leaves you as you are. Your life doesn't have to change. And you don't have to turn from your sin. You don't have to walk the, the right paths with which John calls people to walk. You can keep on living with your girlfriend. You can keep on being a dodgy businessman. You can keep on partying and having a good time. And you know what? You can still label yourself a Christian. No need to repent. But what does John say? What, is, what does Jesus say? Well, he warns, if there is no repentance, what is there? There's judgment. There's the prospect of judgment. Uh, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. That, that's a judgment motif. It's saying if there's, if there's no repentance, that the tree is going to be cut down and exposed to judgment. If you've never repented of your sins before, that's why I plead with you, repent of your sin. Turn to Christ for forgiveness. Turn from your life of sin to a life of obedience, a life of righteousness. You know, if, if you had have been there on that day, uh, observing John's ministry, if I had have been there, I think we would have been scandalised by John's message. Because the Pharisees, you've got to understand, they were the good people. They were the, the most righteous of the, of the righteous nation. And, and John is saying to them, you people who think you're so righteous, you need to repent as well. Isn't the gospel the great equaliser? The drunk who lives in the gutter is called to repent. The respectable, middle-class person spending all their days in comfort needs to repent as well. Every single person, even if you go to church every week, even if you're a pastor, you need to repent. We all have the same problem, don't we? We're all sinners. To be sure, we all have a unique way of expressing our sin, don't we? But the message remains the same for us. We, we need to repent because the King is near. The King is near. The King is near. The King is coming again. Jesus is going to come again in all his glory and wrap up human history. The kingdom of heaven is very near. What do you need to do? We need to repent. It's the necessary preparation. In order to be ready for the coming of the kingdom, we need faith and repentance. And, and if you're a Christian, you understand that the whole of the Christian life is a life of repentance. It's not a you know, one-off thing. You do it once. I, I repented kind of 60 years ago or 10 years ago or whatever it is. Uh, no, no. Uh, the Christian life is a life of continual repentance. It's a life of continual turning from sin. Uh, turning from sin, seeking forgiveness, turning to God for strength to live in, our, in, in righteous ways. Uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism puts it like this. It is purposing and endeavouring constantly to walk with Christ in all the ways of new obedience. Constantly endeavouring to walk with Christ in all the new ways of obedience. That's what we're called to as Christians. What, what is the Lord uh, asking you uh, to repent of this morning? So that's the <clears throat> message of this unique ministry. 
And now let's consider the work of this unique ministry, the work of this unique ministry. One of the, the key works, of, of course, that John performed was baptism. Uh, we need to be clear, it's not Christian baptism that John is administering here. Uh, it's a baptism of, of repentance. It's an outward sign that the, the person has repented uh, from their sins. So anyone baptised by John here at the Jordan, uh, if they became a Christian later on, they, they also would have required to, be, uh, to, to have Christian baptism administered to them. So this is different to kind of the baptisms we're used to. Uh, but, but the clear message here is that John's baptism is an inferior one. He says in verse 11, you know, don't get all excited about the baptism I'm administering. It's, it's just water baptism for repentance. The one who comes after me, oh, he has a far better baptism to, to offer. He's, he's more powerful than me. And one of the ways you're going to see that he's more powerful than me is that he baptizes with Holy Spirit and fire. Now, these are not two kind of separate baptisms, you know, kind of Holy Spirit one and a fire one. It, it, it's the same thing. Uh, it baptizes with Holy Spirit and with fire. And the one who administers that baptism is, of course, Jesus. That's who he's talking about. John wants us to understand that it's Jesus' baptism that we really need. Our desperate need is not for water baptism, our, whether John's or, or Christian baptism, our desperate need is for the baptism that Jesus can give. Uh, what, what's the difference between his baptism and, and, and water baptism? Well, well out, water baptism is an outward thing. It's an, it's an outward uh, ritual uh, that, that points us to, to spiritual realities. It's not unimportant, but it's an outward ritual. But when the Holy Spirit comes, He comes to do something inside our hearts. He comes to bring in our transformation. He, he applies the work of Jesus on the cross to our hearts and He internally cleanses us from all of our sins. He comes with His purifying fire to burn away all the impurities that, that live within us. He comes, as the Old Testament prophets predicted he would come, to, to bring to people refreshment and, and, and renewal and to write the law of God upon our hearts. Or to put it another way, uh, Jesus alone has the power to do in us what, what we can't actually do for ourselves, to, to transform us from the inside out. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John, you see, John's great work was not baptism. You know what his great work was? It was to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he could do for sinners. That's his great work. Because Jesus Christ alone has the power to make our lives anew. He alone has the power to enable us to turn from sin and, and to actually repent. And turn to him. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, A sinner can no more repent and believe without the Holy Spirit's aid than he can create a world. That's why Jesus is so much greater than John. John could give a baptism of repentance, but he couldn't create repentance. But Jesus can do that for you. He has the power to give you a repentant heart. He has the power to make you sensitive to sin and to hate it and to want to flee from it and to live for Him. He has the power to give you a heart that finds forgiveness in Him for all your sins and a desire to live to please Him. And if you're a Christian, you only get baptised in, by Jesus in the Spirit once, but you can look to Him and to His power and to His grace to enable you to go on repenting all the days of your life. So John had a unique ministry, but he had a timeless message that we should look to the one greater than John the Baptist, that we should look to Jesus who can baptize us with spirit and with fire. So let's, let's be a people who constantly look to him. That's what this table is designed to do to enable us to focus our attention on Him so that we might turn from our sin, that we might turn to His grace and that we might repent from all our sins. Amen. We're going to 
respond in song now. We're going to use the words of uh, wonderful grace. And in this hymn, uh, we sing of the, the power of God to, to transform and change us. That the power is not found in us, it's, it's found uh, in Him. So let's uh, stand and sing together. And after we've sung, uh, can the elders who are helping with the Lord's Supper please come forward? Brothers and sisters in the Lord, uh, in this uh, worship service, uh, the Lord calls us uh, to this table that we might have uh, communion, uh, fellowship with Him, and also with each other. Let's listen to what the Gospel tells us about the first celebration of the Lord's Supper. In the night before He went to the cross, Jesus took bread, uh, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to His disciples, saying, "'Take and eat, this is my body.'" Then he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. It's the will of the Lord that all believers join in this communion. For although it's true that our sins make us completely unfit to come into His presence. It is just as true that Christ has offered Himself as a payment for all of our sins. And surely, this is exactly what the Lord's Supper teaches us. All who trust in Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen, are accepted by God in grace. They may share at this table the communion with the Lord Jesus Christ and with all who in trial and persecution... Uh, look with uplifted head to that great day of the Lord when Jesus returns. However, all who trust in themselves for their peace with God and those who do not repent of their sins, those who do not desire humbly to live in obedience to God and at peace with their neighbour, are urgently called to seek the newness of life which only God's grace can give. Otherwise, they should not come to this table lest they eat and drink uh, judgment to themselves. So the bread and the wine, they represent the, the body and the blood of our Saviour. They don't turn into the body and blood of our Saviour, they represent His body and blood. And so they are received in faith and, 
as signs and seals of all his benefits on the cross. So they're, so they're signs, you know, pointing us to Jesus and all the benefits that we, that we have in him. They're signs pointing us uh, to forgiveness, to justification, to adoption, to repentance. To repentance, that's, that's a benefit Christ has secured for us through his work. The bread and the wine, they're an illustration and they're also a, a guarantee. They're a guarantee uh, to, to believers of the forgiveness of our sins, of the strengthening of our faith and of the communion that we have with the Lord as well as with each other. Uh, these signs and seals of the covenant of grace declare that God is faithful in fulfilling all His promises to His covenant partners. So they declare God's faithfulness, but they also call us to respond to His faithfulness. They, they call us, these signs and the seals, they're, they're calling us to respond, to live as God's children in this world. Before we come to the table, let's pray together. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord our God, we do not come to this table trusting in our own goodness, our own righteousness, our own good works. We come because the Lord Jesus Christ has invited us. He's invited us needy sinners as we are. We know that we need forgiveness and we come because we are hungry for the life that is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that, that He is the bread who has come down from heaven and, and so we come to find nourishment and sustenance for our souls in our Lord Jesus Christ, as we remember all that He has done for us. And so we pray that You would work in our hearts as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that You would strengthen our faith, that where there are doubts, they might be replaced with trust in You. Where there is discouragement, we might find encouragement in, in, the, in the One who said, never will I leave You, never will I forsake You. Where, where there is weariness, we pray that we might find a refreshment for our souls. Where there is uh, hearts which, which are unwilling to, to submit to, to your will and in areas of our life, we pray that you would make us willing to, to submit uh, the whole of our being uh, before our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray that as we come to the table, we might experience the joy of, of fellowship with the living God, that we might wonder at the blessing of being His children and that, that we can sit around the table. Lord, please bless us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We ask this in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. Jesus Christ welcomes uh, to the fellowship of this table uh, all those who uh, trust in Him, alone for their salvation and have made a public profession of faith in Him, uh, those who seek to live uh, upright and, and godly lives and, and those who are in good fellowship in their local church. So uh, let's now uh, come to the table uh, in glad assurance and with joyful praise. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The bread will now be distributed and I ask you to retain the bread so that we can all eat together as a sign of our unity. And while the bread is being distributed, uh, we're going to sing together uh, the words of uh, Come ye sinners, uh, poor and needy. That's what we are, poor and needy sinners. And we come to the table to experience again the riches of God's grace. So let's remain seated as we sing.
the good news of the gospel, isn't it? Not the righteous, but sinners. Jesus came to call and he shed his blood uh, for sinners. So let's take, eat, remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sin. cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is a sharing, a participation in the blood of Christ. And again, I ask you to retain your cups so that we can um, drink together. The two outer rows are grape juice and the others are are not. Um, While the wine is being distributed, uh, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing of our love for the Lord our God. My Jesus, I love you. So let's uh, lift our voices and sing together. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, let's take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sin.
In faith, we've tasted and we've heard of the love of our God for sinners such as us. And in in response, we, we say with the psalmist, I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. The Lord indeed has been good to us. So congregation, would you please stand? Let's uh, pray together and then we'll receive the, the blessing of God. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we could never measure or plumb the depths of your goodness to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. But we pray that more and more we might understand how wide and deep and high and long is the love that you have shown us in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we go out into another week, uh, Lord, that you would equip and empower us by the power of your Holy Spirit to live as your children and to bring glory to you through our lives. We ask this uh, in Jesus' name as we say together. Amen. A closing song will be uh, for your gift of God the Spirit, but before we uh, sing together uh, in faith, uh, receive uh, God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and grant you His peace. And all God's people said, Amen.